morning. Thank you. Good morning to all of you who are joining from Hong Kong and good evening for those who are joining from the other side of the globe. Many thanks to Professor Lawrence Grossberg for taking out his evening hours and giving us this lecture. Um, the lecture will be recorded. During the lecture, if you have questions, you're very welcome to type it into the chat. And at the very end of our section, we'll also have a 30 to 45 minutes of Q&A. Uh, you're, um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask the question. If somehow the condition isn't right, you want your question to be read out loud, you can also indicate that uh, when you type your question in the chat. The public lecture is sponsored by the Center of Cultural Studies at the uh, Department of Cultural and Religious Studies. Uh, many thanks for Professor Tanjia Nokas and Fancy for supporting and helping out with this event. My name is Xuanan Cao. I am Assistant Professor of Cultural Studies at the Department of Cultural and Religious Studies. I will be the moderator for today. So today the talk is called what was cultural studies? And there is no one other other than more fitting person than Professor Lawrence Grossberg for uh, giving a talk on this topic, who he has been doing cultural study for more than 50 years. And he's the author of uh, many books. The ones that I still keep returning to these days includes uh, quite a lot. Um, the recent one is Under the Cover of Chaos, Trump and the Battle for the American Right. And then we all want to change the world, the paradox of the US left. This one I think has a Chinese translation. And then of course his earlier book, Caught in a Crossfire, Kids, Politics and America's Future. And then the one that we all read in our graduate school uh, just a couple of years, not too long ago is Cultural Studies in the Future Tense. The Chinese translation was also out five years ago. His work, Professor Lars Grossberg's work, always helped me understand why the intellectual efforts on the left had not been successful in telling the type of stories that could drive the political outcome we want, which is still very relevant today. And his more theoretical work is also directed towards this goal of finding the best ways to tell ourselves about the work we do. Without further ado, um, let's welcome Professor Grossberg. Can you all uh, hear me? Can yes. You hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me, and uh, thank you for coming uh, early in the morning. I appreciate that. Um, I do want to start by saying this is one of those moments when I feel the limits of intellectual work because there are events happening, some of them in China, but some elsewhere that seem uh, more urgent than my latest ruminations, thoughts on cultural studies. But then I remind myself, I sat there reminding myself this afternoon that ideas do matter. Um, and that it is our job as intellectuals to think beyond the obvious, um, especially in the face of um, an increasingly scary world. I've been interested for, God, uh, 60 years, uh, almost 60 years in trying to understand the question of social and political change. Um, especially in the United States, because it's the context I know quite well. Um, but increasingly, I've tried to escape American parochialism and to uh, learn what's going on both intellectually and politically in other parts of the world. Um, I'm particularly interested in the question um, uh, of um, why the world or large parts of the world seem since the 1950s, since the end of the Second World War, um, to be moving generally in directions that are 
increasingly inhumane. Um, and why, um, why the progressive forces, I don't know if left is a useful term um, in, in Hong Kong or Asia, but why progressive forces seem incapable of entering in with agency into the processes of historical change. Um, I want to tell you a story, at least part of a story, or actually I want to give you a kind of plot summary because even my little part of the story would probably take hours and as some of you know, I can speak for hours. Um, so I want to give you a plot summary of a story which is about uh, cultural studies as a successful but failing project, right? if I may. Now, I, I've not written the end of the story um, because I think it's not my place to write the end of the story. The end of the story belongs to younger generations who are leading struggles around the world, both intellectually and politically. And I know that there are many people in many places who in a way are trying to write the end of the story <coughs> from their own places. This story is about, <coughs> excuse me, this story is about the dialectic between a social and material context and the ideas, concepts, and theories that emerge out of that context and respond to that context. Uh, this is a kind of constitutive relation. Theory and context uh, exist in what Stuart Hall called a unity in difference. They remain different, but they forge a unity. And the question is, how is that done? And how is it done successfully? Um, it starts with the world, or, you know, I, I guess I should speak about the United States, but I think my, um, I think it's happened in other places, according to my colleagues and friends around the world. There are moments when a social formation, a society, seems to be in crisis. Right? In fact, uh, the, a society seems to have many crises at the same time, and one doesn't know how to deal with them separately or together. Right? But the basic equilibrium of a society it's, it's status quo, it's ability to maintain and reproduce itself, at these moments is displaced, deformed, right? And one, the society goes through a series of struggles uh, around the world, the point at which this happens most is in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, and while most Americans think it's a uniquely American phenomenon, 1968, we all know that it was not, uh, and that this kind of disruption, this kind of struggle uh, to find a new possibility, a new balance in the field of forces and power, right? These are transitional moments, which are often characterized by widespread feelings of uncertainty, anxiety, and a feeling that one no longer has control over one's life, a loss of any sense of agency. Um, now, these feelings and this sense of crisis uh, can arrive not only in liberal democratic societies, the, the North Atlantic, um, but they're also been arriving, as it were, in authoritarian states, many of which have either emerged from this crisis or remain in crisis. 
what one finds at these moments is that intellectuals find it difficult to make sense of the context, this, this social formation in crisis. And they find, I found, you know, I could make it personal, uh, but many more people than me found that the dominant theories, explanations, and even methodologies for understanding what's going on in the world don't seem to be working. Um, and what I want to suggest is that that's true now. That's where I'll end up. Um, and so cultural studies faces its own dilemma. Now, again, I, want, I will keep emphasizing this over and over again. Such moments of crises and the various feelings that I've, I've mentioned that accompany it um, is not unique to one place, nor is it unique to one time. This has happened before. You know, when Karl Marx said, everything solid melts into the air, he was describing a moment of such a crisis in Europe, um, particularly in Germany and Britain. All right. These, you know, I, I think today part of the problem is people think we have never been through these things before, and we have. Um, and understanding that, understanding the history is perhaps part of the necessary work to understanding the present. Um, now, in such a moment of crisis, there are many ways of responding, both politically and uh, intellectually. Um, intellectually speaking, one way of responding to a crisis of how to make sense of what's going on is to double down on the existing intellectual practices. So one of the things we see, not just in the, the United States, but in other parts of the world, is an increase, a, a, once again, an increasing turn to science. Um, and one can see this in certain kinds of cultural theories that are increasingly citing you know, quantum mechanics or the latest developments in biology. The turn to what one assumes to be the truth or the truthiness, as my friend calls it, the truthiness of science. Or some people don't return to the dominant intellectual practices, but, but turn instead to older or what Michel Foucault called subjugated practices of knowledge. All right? And so we recover the alternatives to the dominant practices of knowledge by going to those who were excluded from those institutions and practices and had to develop their own forms of knowledge production, of cultural expression, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But the point of all of this work is to produce better accounts or analyses or stories, however you want to think, of what's going on so that one can offer better strategies for directing change, so that one can recover the sites and forms of agency, which will allow people to respond to this social context in crisis and to hopefully move in directions that are more humane. Um, as I said, you know, one of the effects of this, uh, the third response, I suppose, so that you can go double down on science, you can go to subjugated knowledges. And the third way of dealing with it is to question the existing practices of knowledge production, not to throw them out. Too often those who turn to um, subjugated knowledges throw out what is useful and good in the dominant practices of knowledge production and the dominant uh, forms of knowledge that we have. Right? It involves then taking what exists as knowledge production, thought, thinking, and 
questioning it, bringing those old practices together with some new practices, sometimes rethinking those old practices. For example, the way uh, in the past 30 or 40 years, anthropologists have rethought ethnography, right? Um, they critiqued it and they rethought it in a different context, right? Um, and, and that's what cultural studies, that's how cultural studies emerged. That's what it tried to do. It tried to question the dominant intellectual practices of the university um, and not to throw them away and find totally new ones, but to find the ways of understanding the context that give you the best possible analyses. Because I do believe that bad analyses, I always say bad stories make for bad politics. Right? If you don't understand what's going on, this sense of intellectual experimentation, of trying to find another way of doing intellectual work requires new institutional or reconceived institutional arrangements and new kinds of forms of cooperation intellectually. Uh, uh, institutional and social arrangements that would allow intellectual uh, discourse and disagreement to flourish. Uh, that would allow for a sense of experimentation, both intellectually and institutionally. And I'll come back to this in a few moments when I um, talk about uh, the Center for Cultural Studies in Birmingham. So as I said, cultural studies uh, tried to do this. Um, and when I say cultural studies for the moment, I mean me and to some extent, my close relationship with what is generally called British cultural studies, uh, which is where I you know, was educated. Um, I want to just say that I think of cultural studies as both a multiplicity, right? There are lots of different versions of cultural studies, lots of different ways of doing cultural studies. Um, even within British cultural studies, there are lots of differences and arguments, um, but it's also a process. It's both a multiplicity and a process, and it's supposed to keep on changing. Uh, it's supposed to keep on changing as the context and resources available to us as intellectuals keeps changing. And I think given the changes in the academy, in the universities over the past 30 or maybe 50 years, that has become more and more difficult, right? Um, and in a sense, that also is what I want to talk about. So uh, cultural studies appropriated, redefined, used a set of tools, intellectual tools or commitments in order to find better ways to understand what's going on. And I want to just recite them, if you will, and elaborate them just a bit. We can talk more about it if you want. These are for me, the defining conditions of cultural studies. Do I think it's contextually defined? Well, yes and no. That is, when someone comes to me with a project that does not have these commitments, my first question is always, well, why do you think you're doing cultural studies? And sometimes people convince me that they are, even though they don't have uh, the full set of commitments I'm going to outline. So let me do this. The first is critique. Now, I, you know, what, what's happened in a lot of places is that Critique has taken, has come to mean criticism, All right? So critique comes to mean calling out racist media or racist states or, you know, patriarchal things, things you don't think are good, you call them out. You can read a film 
uh, and see its colonial ideology, right? That isn't what critique is for me. It certainly wasn't what it meant when Kant and Marx and later Foucault took up the notion of critique. Critique involves challenging that which is taken for granted, right? It means looking for the conditions of possibility for what is. How did the present come to be what it is, right? That's the question of critique. Whether it's good or bad isn't in the first instance the important question. In the first instance for critique, the important question is, what are the forces that are constructing social reality in this context, whatever context you're work, working? What are the forces that are maintaining or challenging the social equilibrium, right? What are the forces that are battling to offer different ways of what Deleuze would call holding back the chaos, right? This is a form, critique then is almost inevitably linked to what is generally referred to as constructionism. That is, the world is not given, the world is constructed through the, in part at least, through the activities of human beings. You know, uh, as Marx put it, people make history, but in conditions not of their own making. People make history, right? And cultural studies took up this notion of critique as constructionism in Stuart Hall's, probably the most common way in which people talk about it in cultural studies, in the English speaking world especially, is uh, in the notion of articulation. Um, articulation simply means that social reality is constantly being made through the production of relations. It assumes that the basic unit of social existence is the relation. Now I have a friend, a wonderful intellectual, Arturo Escobar, who tends to talk as if theories of relationality are something that was invented in the uh, 1990s. But it was invented in the 18th, in the early 19th century, Kant had a theory of relationality. Almost every modern philosopher, not only in the West, but elsewhere, as I've come to discover, has a theory of relationality. So cultural studies is interested in the constant processes by which relationships are made, unmade, and remade. That is the contingency of history. So I'll give you one example, um, which is that it is traditional common sense in the West, at least, that the working class is anti-capitalist. And therefore, you know, in England, they're supposed to vote for labor. In the United States, they're supposed to vote for the Democratic Party, uh, et cetera, et cetera. People seem to assume that this relationship was guaranteed. It had to be that way. Right? But of course, what Thatcher did in England and what Reagan did in the United States, and I'm sure there are examples of this that you can think of, what they did was to break the relationship, unmake the relationship between the Democrat, you know, the kind of liberal democratic anti-capitalist politics, limited anti-capitalism, but, uh, and the working class. And they re-articulated the relationship so that a significant part, not the entirety, but a significant part of the working class ended up voting for Ronald Reagan. Um, and similarly for Donald Trump, okay? That, that's all the first commitment, the basic philosophical foundation for cultural studies, but not just for cultural studies. 
for lots of other formations, intellectual formations that have emerged in the past 60 years, which have adopted this kind of critical constructionist theory of social change. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is um, European, you know, the, the domination, the dominance, uh, again, in the West, but you know, through its global influences in many parts of the world of a certain kind of enlightenment and post-enlightenment, uh, of a variety of enlightenment and post-enlightenment philosophies. Um, and that, of course, has since the 1960s been under attack from lots of different intellectual and political positions. The notion of subjectivity, uh, the notion of consciousness, right? But cultural studies, and again, some other intellectuals, um, focused on one problem. They said, we said, that the problem with the dominance of European modern thought was its claim to universality. Um, what one philosopher calls uh, the transcendental pretense. You know, beginning with Descartes and Hume and Kant and Hegel, et cetera, uh, to a lesser, but still to some extent Marx, um, Western philosophers and thinkers have generalized from, the Euro from European experience to a universal experience. This was the justification. I, I don't think it was invented for this purpose, but it was the justification for colonialism, right? Because if to be human meant to have the kind of experiences that defined European life, and people in other parts of the world didn't have those experiences, then those people were not human, or at least they were, you know, primitive humans or subhumans or something. And therefore we were not violating our own faith by colonizing them and subjecting them to extraordinary forms of violence. Um, against that universalism, cultural studies offers a radical contextuality. It thinks contextually. I, so let me say a few words about what that means. To think contextually is not to fall back into a relativism or a kind of perspectivism. You know, there's a feminist perspective and a black perspective and a Jewish perspective and a Chinese perspective, et cetera, each of which is necessarily relative to its particular position. Cultural studies doesn't believe that. It believes that there are truths that one can find about a particular context. Now, whether those truths will travel to another context is an open question, right? A set of concepts may be very useful in one context, but very useless in a different context. And you, you probably don't know until you try. I once wrote a book um, about United States politics using uh, Stuart Hall and others model that they had developed uh, to analyze Gramsci, uh, Thatcherism. And I tried to write a book about Reagan using their model and I found it was the most boring book I'd ever read. So I had to throw it out and ask myself, tell myself that those concepts, those tools may not work in this context. The context is different. The tools have to be different. Therefore, the theory has to be different. Right? Theory is contextual. Uh, in the United States, when you go on the job market um, in the academy, often the first question you get is, what's your theoretical position? And the cultural studies answer is, 
I don't have one. Tell me what the problem, what the context and the problem is, and I'll tell you what theoretical tools I might try out to begin with, right? Similarly, politics is contextual, right? Um, in the sense that you don't know what the politics of a particular struggle or context are until you do the work of trying to give a critical constructionist analysis of what's going on, right? Um, which means that you can't assume that everything is all about the same thing. Like it's all about capitalism or it's all about racism. Or I had a, read a paper not, uh, not uh, long ago, which argued that everything, all the problems in the world are due to patriarchy, which is the fundamental form of power. Um, cultural study says nothing is all about the same thing. And not everything is about the same thing. So while it may be useful in one context to start with capitalism, uh, it may be useful in a different context to start with race and racism, or to start with um, ethnicity, or to start with gender politics, or different ways of beginning to try to organize, to reorganize, to rearticulate the context so as to understand it better. And that means one is absolutely committed to complexity, right? The complexity of everything. When I, there's a comic in America called Peanuts. I don't know if it ever comes into the Asian world, but when I was growing up, I had my favorite Peanuts cartoon, which basically in which the young, childlike hero uh, says, I can't deal with the world. Everything is more complicated. Right? And that I think is a commitment to cultural studies. Everything from the individual to the mountains of the state, they're all more complicated, right? An individual is not a single essential thing. Being a woman is not a single essential thing. Being black is not a single essential thing. Being Chinese is not a single essential thing, right? It's complicated. No one is just Chinese. They're a woman or a man. They have a sexuality. They have a passion, their own passions, right? You can't reduce things to their simplest level, right? Uh, that is a dominant practice. I once gave a paper where we were talking about, I and another um, academic were talking about youth and the problems of youth. This must have been in the 1970s. And at the end of it, we were supposed to each comment on the others. And the other um, speaker stood up and he looked at me and he said, I don't understand what you've done because you've taken a complicated problem and you've made it more complicated. And I said, well, that's good because I don't understand what you did because you take a complicated problem and you simplify it. So how are you gonna solve the problem if you don't understand its full complexity? All of the articulations, all of the relations, all of the forces that are at work here, right? Um, and what's amazing about human social, one of the things amazing about human social existence is that out of this complexity, we develop order. Out of the multiplicity of individualities that exist within me, I never, I still develop a sense of myself, right? Um, out of the fragmentation or what, you know, people in England call the hybridity of the world, we develop ways of living with that complexity, with those differences, right? Um, now, 
that often led British cultural studies to try to identify a particular level of analysis, right? Where, at what level of analysis could you deal with the complexity, embrace the complexity, but also find a way to understand how it was being organized, what forces were at work, and how one might reorganize the complexity. Uh, how, how one might take uh, an individual who, for example, in the United States, seems to be a racist, but at the same time is a feminist. And at the same time is what my friend John Clark calls a decent, ordinary person. Right? How, how do you deal with that complexity? And how do you rearrange it, rearticulate it, so as to move someone away, perhaps, from their racism to a different um, political uh, position and a different social position? The level they identified, they called the conjuncture, because it stands between two other levels the level of the particular individual. Uh, the level of the concrete event. If one tried to understand um, Donald Trump's election in 2016, you would be overwhelmed by the complexity of the explanation, right? The media and many academics give simple explanations. You know, uh, he won because the white working class voted for him. The white working class didn't vote for Trump. A fraction of it did, about a third. Yeah. Half of Trump's votes came from middle class, suburban homes. Right? But we ignore the complexity. Right? The complexity is overwhelming at the level. You know, when Jean Paul Sartre tried to write a biography of uh, Genet, it ended up being a thousand pages. And he, he says he only began to scratch the surface, right? Because of the complexity at that level. On the other hand, there is the level of abstraction that you might call the epoch, right? Capitalism, uh, Christianity, Confucianism, uh, racism. These are things that, these are forces that have existed for centuries. You know, I mean, capitalism is not new. And the critique of capitalism isn't new. These are epochal forces that change in specific contexts. But nevertheless, to understand them, you have to understand them as epochal forces and not as events or even conjunctures, although they may enter into conjunctures. So that's the second set of commitments I want to identify. Uh, the third is what makes cultural studies, cultural studies as opposed to something else, which is of course, the recognition after the second world war around the world through many um, intellectual paths that culture mattered. In some cases, you know, in England, the question of culture came up because of what was called the Americanization of English culture. Culture was in crisis. And Richard Hoggard and Stuart Hall and other people, Raymond Williams said, boy, we better figure out a way to talk about culture and to talk about the way in which culture operates within the context. What effects is it having? What are the forces, the conditions that are producing it? Right? Culture matters. And it also matters as ideas, as theories, as explanations, right? Knowledge matters. <clears throat> so it brings culture into the agenda in one way or another, whether it's called discourse, whether it's called ideology, whether it's called the popular, right? It turns attention to the fact that culture along with politics and economics has become an increasingly powerful force in modern societies. It probably always has been, 
but it was not quite so visibly determining as it was after the Second World War. But while cultural studies says culture matters, cultural studies isn't about culture. It's about how culture works in the context. Right? It's about context. Media studies is not cultural studies. Right? Literary studies is not cultural studies because they have objects that they want to understand. Cultural studies doesn't have an object. It only has tools. So when I wrote about rock and roll, right, I wasn't interested in rock and roll. I mean, um, it wasn't that I wanted to write a book about rock and roll. I wanted to write a book about the importance of music in the political struggles of the 1960s and 70s. Now, in order to do that, I had to figure out how to talk about rock and roll or popular music. But it wasn't my object. My object was the state of American society in the 1960s and 70s. Final thing I want to say about the conditions of cultural studies is, and this, this is what struck me when I first showed up at the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies uh, at Birmingham in England, which is one of the places where cultural studies was kind of invented, but there were many others in Latin America, in Asia, perhaps in Africa, I know less about it. Um, it was not just that they were questioning the dominant intellectual practices. It was that they did it with a particular, what now theorists would call affective tone. What, you know, what we could call a certain emotional landscape. Cultural studies brought together three very different emotions. And I think if you don't have all three, you have a problem. Uh, one is passion. One of the reasons I left the academy, I retired, wasn't just because I was getting old. It was because too many of my colleagues didn't think that their intellectual work mattered. So they really had no passion beyond their own hobbies, right? I mean, you can love Shakespeare and spend your life studying Shakespeare, but you don't really think anyone's gonna read your book or that your book has any significance beyond the Shakespeare society, right? I found a group of people who were passionate about their intellectual work because they thought it mattered, because they thought as I always say, better stories make better politics. We had to find better ways to understand what was going on in the world so we could change the world in the ways that we would hope the world would become. That's first. Second is despair, Desp absolute despair. You know, Gramsci, who had a great influence on British cultural studies. He talked about how the intellectual must have, what is it, pessimism uh, of the intellect, optimism of the will. Now, you know, what I discovered was, if you think you're pessimistic, I mean, actually, Stuart Hall said this to me when I was complaining about how bad things were in the United States under Reagan, he said to me, you haven't begun to reach the pits of despair if you actually understood how bad things really are, right? You're still operating on the surface. You don't yet understand. You haven't reached the point of despair. And I think cultural studies tries to reach it. Now you have to probably stop short of despair because then you might kill yourself. And that's not a good thing for intellectuals to do. I think it was Mao who said the first function of a revolutionary is to stay alive. 
Um, so passion and despair. And the third piece of the emotional puzzle is humility. Now I'm the worst person in the world to talk about humility because I'm an arrogant son of a bitch. But I struggle to be humble. I struggle to be humble because I know that even when my work is at its best, it's only one piece of the bigger puzzle. And I know that I might be wrong and that I need other people to work alongside me, right? Uh, that other arguments may persuade me to change my analysis or my position. So I embrace what I do with humility. Stuart Hall once said, um, describing teaching, he said, you have to go into a classroom and give a lecture on whatever it is, structuralism, as if you were passionately certain that structuralism was right. And then the next time you meet the class, you go in and tell them that you were probably wrong. Right? It's that sense of um, the possibilities that reach beyond what one person can do that I think defines the third leg, if you will, of cultural studies. Now, I want to say a few words about British cultural studies, which for a whole variety of reasons, complexity, uh, one of them being the domination of English as a language, the domination of the English language publishing industry, of the US university system, et cetera. <clears throat> British cultural studies is probably the most globally influential um, version of cultural studies. Um, it is probably what enables us to speak across different boundaries. Uh, and of course, Stuart Hall is largely responsible for that, um, not only because of his work, but because of his charismatic embodiment of the emotional landscape I just described. Now, British cultural studies, when it starts off in the 50s, is rather boring. It did, it did know all, it did know that culture battered, and it did know that the world was complex and that it needed to find better intellectual tools, but it didn't know it very deeply. Right? And the early forms of cultural studies at the center. Uh, including Richard Hoggart's very important book, The Uses of Literacy, were in retrospect, not all that interesting. Um, British cultural studies blossomed uh, in the late 60s when it started, well, actually, yes, in the late 60s, when in fact, the British new left moved into the university. Much of the work of British cultural studies derives from what was called the British New Left in the late 1950s and early 60s, right? Um, and with that, which I'll talk about in a moment a little more, uh, it introduced a number of concepts of tools for thinking that have proven very useful in a variety of contexts, although their meaning may change from one context to another. But, you know, it sort of made subcultures uh, um, a powerful concept. It made notions of contextualism powerful. It made notions of organic crises, of hegemony, uh, of very famously Stewart's description of Thatcherism as authoritarian populism, um, and it joined with other intellectual formations in rapidly expanding the field of political struggle beyond Marx, beyond the class struggle, 
beyond the distribution of wealth and the production of value to talk about issues of gender and race and sexuality um, and all such things, right? Um, and it attempted, it had in mind a particular kind of politics. If you read any of the British work or mine for that matter, uh, I wouldn't recommend mine, but I would recommend Stewart's or Paul Gilroy's or Angela McRobbie or John Clark or any one of them. Um, what you find is not only an analysis of Thatcherism or an analysis of the current dominant political formations, but an analysis and critique of the opposition, right? So Stuart Hall's writings on Thatcherism are as much about the failure of labor, the Labour Party and the Socialist Party and the Communist Party to deal, to respond to Thatcherism in a way that might have enabled them to prevent what has happened in Britain and much of the world uh, since the mid seventies. Right? They identified two kinds of politics that the left seemed to put forth. One was vanguard politics. Vanguard politics basically says, most people are stupid. They don't understand the world. They don't understand their place in the world, but we do, right? And therefore we should lead them. We are the vanguard. The communist party in Russia was the vanguard. And in fact, the elite of the communist party in Russia was the vanguard of the vanguard, right? The rest of the people were idiots, right? They were dopes. They were distracted. They were the subjects of ideological misrepresentation. We saw the truth and we would bring people to the promised land if only they just did what we told them to do, right? At the other end is uh, populist politics which um, has become the dominant politics in the United States and in many parts of the world. And populism says, no, the people are in dopes. The people are exactly where the truth is. So we should just go with what the people want, or at least we should pretend that we're going with the people want, with what the people want, right? People should believe that their understanding of the world, that their values, that their common sense, that their desires are true, are right, are correct, and should define the future of society. Right? And so you mobilize the people in the name of the people right? to lead the struggle. Cultural studies rejected both of those notions of, politi of uh, political struggle. And it argued for uh, what I have called a popular politics. A popular politics says, you can't assume people are dopes. You can't assume people are idiots. People are trying, most people are trying to live the best life they can with the limited resources they have. And you have to respect that and then try to move it. Uh, Stuart Hall, when he wrote the editorial for the first uh, issue of the very influential journal that he founded, New Left Review, he said that politics must start where people are, right? But not in a populist sense to assume that where people are is where they should be, but in a popular sense, that tries to move people by understanding where they are to someplace better, not by telling them that where they are is shit, you know, and they need to follow us to a better place, but by listening to them, by analyzing why they are what they are. The, one of the founders of queer theory in the United States, Eve Sedgwick, put it beautifully, 
she said, we have to stop telling people what they should feel, excuse me, and start trying to understand what they do feel and why they feel that, how it has been produced. What are the forces that have constructed their experiences and feelings about the world? And only then can we ask the question, how do we move them? How do we change that? Now, the other thing um, that the center did and cultural studies continues to do is to create a space for experimental institutional work. Um, you know, the center for cultural studies at Birmingham was not exactly an official university entity. It wasn't like a department or a program. No one quite knew what it was, which was very good for the people at the center because they could do whatever they want. I'll tell you a secret that Stuart once told me is that when he was director, his primary job was to keep the administration of the university from ever coming to the center where they would see what was going on and realize that the center was breaking every rule the university had. For example, the center admitted graduate students by giving the power of admission to the existing graduate students. The faculty didn't have a say in what graduate students would be admitted. Their argument was, these people are coming in and going to do collaborative collective work with the other grad students. So why not let them decide whom they wanted to work with? Why, why should the faculty have that power, right? That kind of experimentation, right? They established one of the first series of what they called working papers, which were, you know, not, not finished products, but ideas in process, which they wanted to share with people. They were one of the first universities that reached out to non-university institutions, whether they were technical colleges or the equivalent of high schools, and tried to provide material, resources, to help them teach their students about the contemporary context. Okay, uh, how am I doing? I, I, do I have 10 more minutes? Yes, you have. You have, uh, if you wrap up um, in uh, 15 or 20 minutes, also okay. Oh, well, I don't want to bore you, so. Uh, oh. Now, the starting point, really, all of this is the backstory of my uh, story. You know, my wife is a novelist. And when she writes a novel, she spends an enormous amount of time creating what she calls the backstory. None of the backstory is going to make it into the novel, but she has to understand each of the characters and the situation uh, that will emerge to drive the novel forward. Right? She has to know the backstory. Where did these people come from? What are the forces that they're facing? What are the dilemmas and limits of their social relations? Right? Well, all of this is the backstory because what I really want to say is about the contemporary context. Because although I don't think much of what is going on is new, uh, I do think the context of work certainly in the United States and Europe and Latin America and you know, from my conversations in part, at least parts of Asia, the context is changing in significant ways. And we have entered another period of a kind of crisis of social equilibrium. And it is time to ask ourselves, how do we tell better stories? How do we have better explanations? What kind of concepts do we need? What kind of intellectual practices do we need? What kind of intellectual institutions 
do we need? I'm quite cynical about the possibilities of the university in the US as a, a viable site for the kind of work that cultural studies tries to do. I'll give you an example of what I mean. So I, I've already told you, I, my early career, I was writing about popular music. Now, it, it was great. I loved it because I love popular music. Uh, I could show you my record collection. Um, and I, I was a huge fan. Um, but as I said, I wanted to understand how that cultural formation was working in the context. What were the forces shaping it and what effects was it having that made it so central? Um, when the, there was a big protest in, the, I think it was the early 1990s, in Seattle against the World Trade Organization, um, a friend of mine, a Mexican journalist, wrote a column in which he said this movement, it was referred to generally as the anti-globalization movement. He said, this movement is going to fail because it doesn't have any music. I thought that was brilliant. Right? So that's what I was trying to figure out. Why is it going to fail? Because it doesn't have music. What does that mean? Uh, and you know, I don't think it can have music today. I don't think there can be uh, a musical formation that functions in the same way as it did in the 60s. So I wrote about it. I wrote tons of essays. And, um, and then in the early 1990s, a very good friend of mine asked me to write a paper or a book he was editing on culture in the 1980s and 90s. And he wanted me to write about popular music in the, you know, from like 1985 to 1990 something. And once again, I did it and I found, I wrote it and I thought, this is incredibly boring and doesn't say anything that any intelligent person, you know, listening to music would say. Why? Well, I realized the context had changed so much. The meaning and experience of youth in the United States had changed. The nature of the corporatism of the cultural industries had changed. The nature of domesticity had changed. The school system had changed. Uh, the musical resources had changed. So the concepts that I had developed for over 15 or 20 years to talk about music in its context no longer worked. Now I could have done one of two things then. I could have said, I'm gonna start over and find the tools, the concepts, the stories that make sense of music in, the, in that context, then what was then contemporary. Uh, but I was I decided I was too old to do that, right? And so I ended up writing a book about the condition of youth rather than about youth culture, right? It didn't work. The context had changed. We needed new resources because we were facing new challenges. We had to rethink the context in that dialectical relationship between intellectual work and its material social context. That dialectical relationship had moved on. And unfortunately, we as intellectuals, me as intellectuals, I don't, I don't want to accuse anyone else, uh, hadn't moved on, at least not sufficiently, to come up. And I just want to throw out some of those challenges that it seems to me we face now that uh, demand that we think about what kind of concepts and tools are necessary, are needed, what, what kind of theories will be useful. I, I don't care about whether theories are true or not. 
Theories are never true. I care about whether a theory is useful to help me understand the context that I am trying to understand. Now, I, I'm sure all of these challenges in one form or another face people in many parts of the world. I, and I'm sure that you are familiar with most, if not all of them. The one about which I will say the least because it's the most obvious is that we now face what can only be understood as an epochal, long-term crisis of climate. Climate change cannot be understood in a conjuncture. It has to be understood as something that has been going on for hundreds of years. Uh, and what is it? What are the forces that have enabled humanity to despoil its own environment so much that its own existence is called into question, right? Climate change. Uh, uh, secondly, I would point to the crisis of the, or crises of the nation state. Right? Most of British cultural studies and most of cultural studies around the world starts by defining the context in nationalist terms. You know, I write about the United States. Paul Gilroy, well, no, Paul's a bad example. He doesn't. Um, um, you know, John Clark writes about Britain. Um, Huan Sin Chen started by writing about Taiwan. Um, we can go on. Um, people write about their national context. But it's no longer clear that that's an adequate way of understanding the world because the contexts we have to write about are both larger than the nation state. Hence, you know, I, I think inter-Asia um, is, is a really brilliant experiment because it recognizes that you can't limit analyses anymore to the nation state, that you have to think regionally or in Paul Gilroy's terms, you have to think about the routes that change is following, right? Uh, Arjun Apadurai's kind of theory of, of the historical routes of the movement of capital, of Christianity, of slavery, of we can follow those routes um, which far exceed the nation state. But at the, same time, at the same time, nation states are becoming smaller. They are re-provincializing themselves, creating micro-nations or emphasizing the sub-national regional differences. In the United States, there was no sense of a national identity until the late 19th century with the advent of the railroads and the telegraph and then radio. Before that, people's identities were defined regionally. I'm a Southerner, I'm a Midwesterner, I'm a Northeasterner, right? Uh, the turn of the 20th century brought a new kind of national identity. The nation became the dominant form of belonging, of identification. But now in the United States, we're returning to those regional identities, right? And the national identity is in crisis. Um, we don't know what it is. We don't know what it's supposed to be. We don't share a national identity anymore. To make matters worse, often appeals to the nation and the nation state seem for some reason, which we don't quite understand, to always, or not always, but often be linked to authoritarian and illiberal transformations of a society. Right? Uh, so the nation state becomes a problematic definition of a context. We need in that sense, to rethink the spatiality and temporality of what a context is. Right? 
the notion of a context, for example, as a conjuncture emerged out of and in response to a particular context. The context has changed. What is it that we're going to use? What are the structures of belonging? What are the structures of identification? Not identity, but identification that motivate, that drive, that define people's ways of living in the world. Uh, the third change is that the post-war capitalist economy is in ruins. Uh, and it has been going down the drain since the end of the three worlds organization of the planet. After the Second World War, the world was divided into three worlds, uh, the communist world, the capitalist world, and the non-aligned world. And the global economy, which was created uh, in the um, settlement of the Second World War, was created to deal with this new context of three worlds. But that has collapsed, right? The communist world isn't communist. Capitalist world, well, it's sort of just gobbling up everything and it's fracturing itself so that capitalism is opposed to capitalism in many profound ways. Um, and, uh, you know, the past, 40 years has been nothing but a series of financial and economic crises because that world, which was stabilized by the Bretton Woods agreements has collapsed. And the Bretton Woods agreements, the World Trade Organization, the IMF, et cetera, don't seem to be working. The United Nations is part of that as well. Um, and at the same time, yet at the same time, that capitalism is continuously in crisis with itself and with the world, uh, it is also increasingly finding ways to insert itself into the bodily habits of people, right? It's not just that capitalism creates desires that we are supposed to fill by consumption, right? Capitalism has gone law far beyond that. It now creates systems of embodied habits that make it almost impossible to imagine another way of living. Now, why, how? Why is it working? How do we fight it? Uh, the fourth, so that's the third. The fourth is a crisis of culture. Now, I, I do not know about the rest of the world. Uh, I do not know the state of the field of culture in, in any places other than the United States, even Britain, I'm not familiar enough with the, speak about. Uh, but in the United States, at least, the field of culture is increasingly chaotic. There is so much culture out there. Right? I mean, I have discussions with my son about how do you decide what music to listen to? Right? Uh, I mean, just go to the streaming services I assume that the, some of them, some version of streaming exists in, uh, in China. Uh, you know, there are 10 million songs on Apple Music. Right? What do you do? Well, I suppose you'll listen to the same songs that you like, or you listen to what your friends tell you, and, but there is a kind of chaos. And it's a chaos of television, it's a chaos of film, it's a chaos of music, but it's also a chaos of information, of opinions, of voices, of knowledge claims, of misinformation, right? So that 
You know, if you Google, um, as I did the other day, I Googled, uh, is bourbon, I like whiskey, is bourbon good for your health? You know, I guess I was looking for some easy justification when my doctor tells me I'm drinking too much. You know, so far all I say to him is, have you looked at the world outside? <laughs> you think I'm drinking too much. I think I'm not drinking enough, right? I Googled it and you know what I found? I found like a hundred thousand things listed and all, you know, they were full of contradictions. One site reported a study that said, Bourbon is bad for your heart. Another site reported a study that said bourbon is good for your heart. Another site, how, how do we decide? I mean, the, the left in the United States is very good of accusing the conservatives, the right, of spreading misinformation. Uh, but the right accuses the left of spreading misinformation. How do we decide What's misinformation, right? How can you possibly know in this chaos, especially when authoritarian forces around the world are weaponizing chaos? If you want to understand Donald Trump and his movement, what in America is called MAGA, Make America Great Again, uh, you have to understand that contrary to the long history of politics, which understood politics to be the attempt to find an organization that held the chaos at bay, they produce chaos intentionally. Um, and Trump's advisors have admitted this. You know? They spread misinformation, not because they want people to believe the misinformation, but because they want people to feel so overwhelmed that they realize there's no way for them to know what's true. So you might as well just go with your gut or you know what you thought was true yesterday. This has again in the United States been supplemented with increasing attacks on education, on school systems, on universities, um, and increasing changes in the academy. The result of all this is two things that I uh, sum up my sense of the chaos. My first take on the context, if you will, without knowing what tools I need to make sense of these crises, of these changes, uh, is that once again, and it's happened before, people think we are living at the end of the world. People think we are, that the world has become entirely crazy, that the world itself is insane, that the chaos has taken over, that the patients, we say in, in English, the patients have taken over the asylum, right? The crazy people are now running the world and telling us, what's true or not, or what's good or not, or determining you know, what foods we get or anything. Again, it's not new, but it, it gives rise in the present context to particular kinds of responses. On the one hand, forms of cynicism, and on the other hand, forms of fundamentalism, whether religious fundamentalism or political fundamentalism. I mean by fundamentalism, any position that is so certain of its truth that it is willing to impose itself upon everyone, right? That scares me. Whether it's, the so it's socialists or Christians, I don't really care. The difference doesn't matter to me. They are both so certain that they have the truth and that everyone else must fall into line, right? Uh, the alternative, cynicism or fundamentalism, is simply to accept the insanity of the world, to accept that the world is insane and that there is no future. 
right? Which is what my son tells me all the time. His generation of Americans does not believe in the future. Now, I don't understand what that means. You see, that's a symptom of my crisis, intellectual crisis. I don't understand what it means to say there is no future. I say to him, of course there's a future. It may be total shit. You know, it may be the worst future we can imagine, but there is a future. And he just says, no. Yeah. If the climate change doesn't kill us, the atomic bomb, the uh, war in Israel or in Taiwan or um, somewhere else in the world, you know, um, um, the Ukraine uh, is going to start another world war in which we will end time. There will be no future. Professor, and then Professor. one, one uh, final. I, mean, hmm? I was one just final, the time. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay, one good. final comment, and this is a personal one. I've said I said before that cultural studies tries to assumes that people are not idiots, that people are not dopes, uh, that people have some sense may not be the same sense we have of what is going on around them and of the choices they make to live their lives in certain ways. But I'll tell you the truth. After 60 years of arguing that and of writing essays and books that start from that position, I'm not sure it's right. It is hard to look at places like the United States or where there are these illiberal movements and where conspiracy theories proliferate, absurd conspiracy theories, you know, like sex trades being run through pizza parlors and not think these people are idiots. I, it's a kind of personal crisis for me. But I still think we have to, I have to move beyond that to figure out how, why this is happening. Why it has become obvious to me that people are idiots when I know conceptually, intellectually, that that is the last thing we need to, to start with if we're trying to make the world a better place, which is what it's all about. How do we create a cultural studies for the future. Thank you. Sorry, I took so long. No, thank you so much. You. Please join me in thank, uh, thanking Professor Grosberg for giving us such a wonderful talk. Now we are going to transition into the Q and A mode, and I know some of you probably are having or typing up questions. Um, um, and here we have. I thought I was going to do a discussion, but here we see one chat. Um, in the meeting. If you would like to ask the questions yourself, uh, you can also unmute yourself. Otherwise, I'm going to read um, first Ming Gao's question. So the first question, 